especially in, when it comes to induction, you'll see what I'm talking about. So you might say, you know, we have a statement, one statement, two statements, three statements, four statements, and so on and so forth. There is something that's called an open sentence. This is a statement involving a variable. This is a sentence that involves a variable. that becomes a statement <coughs> if the variable is defined. Okay. So for example, this guy was not a statement if I just said x is even. However, if I said um, r was, if x is an element of 2, 4, 16, x is even. Now it becomes a statement. I've defined possible values for the variable. Turns out for all of them, it will be um, true that it is even. I've made a statement. I've now made it so that you can determine exactly the truth value of the statement. So, and that's called an open sentence. Um, this, the possible definitions for the variable, this is called the domain of the open sentence. Statement is something that you can determine to be true or false. If you can't determine it, it is not a statement, right? Or if it can be determined that it's both true or false, or neither, it is not a statement, right? So you have to be able to verify the truth value of the statement, right? If you can't verify the truth value, it's not a statement. But there are times when something is open, meaning it's possible to become a statement with further conditions.
which we'll get more on that. These are tables.
So these are all possible arrangements of the state, truth values of the statements P and Q. They can both be true, P could be true but Q could be false, P could be false but Q could be true, or they can both be false, and P or Q is true if any one of them is true, which means it will be true in all cases here, but false here, because neither of them are true here. So it's defining the inclusive or. So the statement P or Q is true when exactly at least one of P or Q is true. And uh, the question that um, Young asked yesterday about how do you know if you're arranging a bunch of sentences or a bunch of things, how do you know you don't miss anyone? Um, well, this is how you arrange them. You always alternate every possible choice in the first column, and then you skip every multiple of two in the second. So you alternate every two to the zero times two, alternate every two to the one times two. If there was a third sentence, you alternate every four. Another statement, alternate every eight. Another statement, alternate every six. So you could say something like, um, if we're looking at the disjunction and conjunction with the original examples, this would be the statement, um, either 2 is even or 17 is even, whereas this would be either 
2 is even and 17 is even, right? And in that case, you can determine the truth that way. So if you're given two smaller statements, you can combine them with and or or to create another bigger statement. Um, implication, a very important kind of statement. This is the statement. If P, then Q. It's written. P R Q or P R Q. If that's your habit. Um, Other sentences that you might describe this as is P implies Q. P is sufficient for Q. P only if Q. Etc. Right? So this is an implication. It's a very important kind of statement. It is super important because it is super far reaching. Pretty much any mathematical statement you encounter will either be an implication or it can be rewritten to be as an implication in an equivalent sense. And we'll talk about equivalent um, in a little bit. So it's a very important kind of statement to get a handle on. So here's the definition. Not fulfilled, 
but the second part follows through. It's not a lie. It isn't a false statement. Literally, the only time this is going to be a false statement is if the first thing happens, but the second thing doesn't. Right? And that's what this table is going to tell you. And that's a very strange thing because in human language, it, it doesn't seem to work that way. Um, we kind of hear implications as by implications. Um, so there can be an example like, if pigs fly, I will pass you for this class. Right? So if you go to the, your professor and he says, Professor, you're going to pass me? Yes, pigs fly. Right? What would you interpret that sentence as? Like him saying no, right? Like I'm definitely not going to pass you. Logically speaking, though, that's not what the sentence means. Right? Because what? Pigs don't fly, as far as we know. Right? So the, the assumption in the first place is a false statement. Right? So he could pass or he could not. You, you can't actually take it as a no. But in everyday human language, you will take it as a no. Right? So, and that's kind of because, or you can look at statements like, if you study, you will pass. Right? So you can ask your friend, you're going to pass that class? If I study hard, I'll pass, right? If you see him the next day and ask him, did you pass it? He says, yes. You're going to probably think, oh, he probably studied hard then. It's not logical to think that, though, right? He could have passed by some other means, right? There's no, there's no telling that this is what caused that, okay? But you'll interpret it that way, and that kind of gets you in trouble when you're reading a mathematical statement, and this is kind of why I spoke about knowing your definitions and being OCD and being diligent because there are times when you'll be reading something in your math book and you'll read one thing but because you're so used to communicating non-verbally and emotionally and you understand something completely different from what you're reading, right? So you have to really put a rein on that and you have to understand that sometimes when you read a statement it's not going to mean what you feel it should mean and we're going to interpret all statements based on what they are logically speaking. So, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but that's the definition. And that's what an implication is. Um, that's, I mean, this is just uh, in, this is just a little vocabulary. It's not, I might, may or may not use these words, so I just want to make sure you know what I'm talking about. In P implies Q, P is called the hypothesis, the antecedent, or the assumption. Um, Q is called the conclusion. So if I ever accidentally use one of these words, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so then another kind of statement. Also a very important kind of statement because it's a combination of implications. It's called the biconditional. And it is going to be the guide that allows us to talk about what is equivalent to what. So, this is the statement. P implies Q and at the same time Q implies P. It's that sort of statement, we call it a biconditional. It is written, that is the long way of writing it out. The short way of writing it out is to write the arrow going in both ways. Or that's much more typical, but later on you will see them writing this, like the like an equal sign with an extra dash, right? So that means that they're not exactly equal, they're not exactly the same statement. However, the truth values of one determine the truth value of the other, vice versa. They will always have the same truth value. And in this
this case, P, Q are said to be equivalent. So now we're defining the word equivalent. Um, for emphasis, you can say logically equivalent. These two statements are logically equivalent. What that means is that they're both true or both false at exactly the same time in every instance. Right? And the sentences might look very different, but they are equivalent. So you might sometimes hear, well, eventually you'll hear things like um, a math person would say, the axiom of choice is equivalent to the well-ordered principle. Now when you hear both of those phrases, both of those theorems, they're very different and they say very different things. Um, but it turns out that if one is true, the other has to be true, and if one is false, the other has to be false. So let's actually show what this means. So if I have P, Q, and I have P in plus. Am I going to space? Yes. Let me. P, Q, P implies Q, Q implies P, and P is So here's true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. We know P implies Q is only false if P happens but Q doesn't happen. It's true otherwise. Q implies P is only false if Q is true but P is false. Otherwise. And so now this means this and that, which means both have to be true at the same time for this guy to be true. So this is going to be true here, and it's going to be true here, and it's going to be false here and false here. Right? So notice um, what happens to this guy if I compare this column to these two columns, what you'll notice is happening is when both P and Q are true, it's true. If they're both false, it's true. If they, they differ, it's false. So this guy is kind of tracking whether or not these two statements actually align in truth values, right? And so in that sense, whenever this is true, we can say these two statements are equivalent. They will have the same truth values in all possible instances. P implies Q is described sometimes as P if and only if Q. You might also see the phrasing if with two F's. So when a math person writes that, it's not that they forgot how to spell the word if. It means that they're talking about a biconditional. They're talking about something that is true in both directions. And it turns out there are a lot of times when someone would say this, but human beings would interpret that, and that's a mistake that you have to watch out for. Right? Um, it's also, you, know, you can also know from this table, and you, another way is to say P is necessary and sufficient for Q. Logically speaking. 
So just because I say, if I study, then I'll pass, it doesn't mean that if I pass, I, it means I study, right? Although people usually would interpret it that way. It's not logical to interpret it that way. Um, what else do we want to talk about? I'll give you a, few, a couple of silly examples. Um, do you have any? Oh, those, that's, those are. I did start out with those silly examples and I was going to give them all the cup. But for example, if we look at the statement P or not P. where you're saying this. 
If P happens, then that means either P or Q happen. Right? Yeah? Is it a tautology? Yeah. Uh, no, well, we'll see. How do you figure it out? Um, very quickly, you could say that P is, um, so P is only going to be false on the bottom half, and then you know that P implies anything is only false, or the true-false case, so you're looking at the second row, and in the second row, P or Q is definitely true. Okay. Let's actually do it by the table. Because this one is short enough for you to see that. Um, yeah, but okay. the sentences can get complicated, right? You have to get lost. So what you do is you build up the sentence, the statements, based on the little smaller groups. So this involves P, it also involves P or Q. So I'll make sure I have P and P or Q together. This would be true, 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 false. And then now I look at this column implies that column. I know this is only false if this guy is true and that guy is false, but that literally never happens. So turns out that this is always true. To say this is a tautology. without using the implication connected. Um, try to define what those are. Things that we use to combine statements, we call them logical connectives. Things like and, or, imply, equivalent, if and only if, are called logical connectors. So try to be as concise as you possibly can. <coughs> Um, 
P and Q or um, not P. P and Q or um, not P and Q. Or not P and not Q. <laughs> like that? Yeah. Uh, I don't there's a shorter one. <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to verify that one. <laughs> Thinking back to my digital logic class. Yeah, there's a there's a shorter way. Yeah? Uh, did you do not G implies P? Okay. Uh, oh, I don't want to use an implication. Oh. That last two should be negative. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's something short. Can we, like a lot short. Can we do uh, not parentheses P and not Q? Not parentheses P, P and not Q. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you're kind of even going a lot farther there. What what would be the there's a way to eliminate this guy, which we'll talk about. You don't need the extra negation. Is it not P or Q? Not P or Q? That's just uh that you said you can remove the negation. That's just Well let's see if not P would be here, and it's true. Or Q would be these two, and that's true. That seems like it might be it. Let's look at that. So we can even go over here, throw in a not P. This would be false, true, false, true. And now let's look at not P or Q. It's true in this sense, it's true in this And you, you wrote down the Q, like that's actually not Q. Oh, yeah, this is false and true true. False, false, true, true. Now let's check again. So we have not P or Q, that's true. Not P or Q, false here. Not P or Q, it's true here. Not P or Q, true here. Turns out that these two guys have the same truth values in all cases. So it turns out that P implies Q is equivalent to saying not P or Q. Either the first thing didn't happen, or the second thing did happen. And that is equivalent to say, if you do this, I will do that. So that's an equivalent statement. Um, okay. So now let's figure out not P implies Q. What do you think that would be equivalent to? P and not Q? P and not Q. So I'm saying this, saying this is equivalent to saying the first thing does not happen or the second thing happened, right? So basically asking for the negation of that is to say what would be the opposite of saying this is, right? Or Q. So that would mean P happened and Q actually happened. And I'll, we'll try me that clear if some of you are confused by that. Why is the and? When I talk about uh, quantified statements, you can get out of, can see more clearly um, why that would be the case. So this is true, this is false, this is true, this is true. Um, not would, of course, have all the opposite truth values. And let's actually do this P and not Q. So this would be this and that, 
not that. Oh, that's false. This and not that. True. It's true. This and not that. False. This and not that. Because this false. is false. It's automatically false. You must have these two are equivalent. By the way, um, so not not p or q is actually equivalent to me saying p and not q. This is a specific instance of a much larger set of theorems called De Morgan's law. This kind of is this is the theory that tells you basically that negating an or gives you an and, negating an and gives you an or in a specific way. So we call it Morgan's laws. So this is like if you have two statements and you know this and that, how would you say that that does not happen? So I'm saying this and that must happen, right? When is the opposite of that true? Yeah? The other side? Hmm? This, this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. Yeah. Not so if I say both must happen together, the opposite of that is not. maybe one didn't happen or the other didn't happen. So this is like not P happen or not Q happen. So the negation of an and statement is the or of the negation of the statements. Quite similarly, if I say this or this must happen, right? What is that saying? Is that neither of them happened? P didn't happen, and not Q didn't happen. So these are called the Morgan's. By the way, as we'll see in a bit later, uh, that's the foundation of something that's called proof by contradiction. So all these tables, I know we're not really going to use them, but they are the foundation of all the techniques that we're going to be learning. Um, we're going to learn things called direct proofs and proofs by contrapositive. Um, we're also going to learn, oh, there's another example. So we know that if P implies Q, it's not the same as saying Q implies P. Um, but let me throw this out there, and you tell me what that is. You can throw these guys in, not P, not Q. It makes it a little bit easier. True, false, true, false. True, true, false, false. P implies Q is false here, true, or else. Uh, not P is false, false. True, true, not true, false, true, false, true. Okay, so what would not Q implies not P look like? True. It would only be false here. If this first part is true but the second part is false, it's false there. But it is true otherwise. That gives us another logical connector, uh, another logical equivalence. This says that P implies Q. If that statement is made, you cannot assume that Q is, implies P, but you can assume that if Q does not happen, it means P did not happen. That's equivalent. By the way, this guy has a name. It's called the contrapositive of P implies Q. It's, it, the, and this kind of relationship is the basis for something that we'll call a proof by contrapositive or an indirect proof. Right? The logical table is kind of what tells us when a certain process of figuring out whether a statement is true or false makes sense, logically speaking. Right? So every, pretty much every proof technique I'm going to teach you for the rest of the class 
foundationally, if you dig deep enough, somewhere down there, there's a truth table that verifies that what we're doing makes sense. Um, by the way, BTW, if I you do this sentence in the opposite way, it's called the converse. So given P implies Q, the opposite statement is Q implies P. That statement, not Q implies not P, is called the contrapositive, and it's actually equivalent to this. So if you want to prove a statement that goes like, if P then Q, you can prove the statement, if not Q then not P, right? If you elect me, I will lower taxes, is the same as saying, So now, um, and that's the converse. So sometimes you'll see math textbook when you're reading. It happens every now and then in a calculus textbook, but from now on, all the math literature, you'll see this language a lot more. They'll say something like, this implies that, but the converse is not true. They'll probably add that sentence sometimes. Right? And this is what they mean. It means that it works in this direction, but it doesn't work in that direction. Even if they don't say that statement, it doesn't mean you can assume it does does work in the other direction, but sometimes they'll go the extra mile and they'll tell you for sure. This is true, but the converse is not true. Right? They'll make, make that statement. Um, so that's Moreland's laws and Some connectors commute. Right? So in math, the word commutes means it works in any order. And it turns out that and and or commute. Right? So saying P and Q is equivalent to saying Q and P. And saying P or Q is equivalent to saying Q or P. So it doesn't matter if, it, if you're connecting two statements with and or or, it doesn't matter in which order you actually see the statements. If you're connecting things with an implication, the order matters. Okay. Um, we also have that properties, these connectives, distribute. In fact, and distributes over or, and or distributes over and. So if you say something like P and Q or R, you can apply a, a distributive property. You can think of the and as multiplication and the or as plus, and so this basically means P and Q or, or P and R. Right? That's to say that and distributes over or. But it, it, you, it turns out you can actually think of it as the other interpretation as well. If you see a statement like that, you can think of the or as the plus and the and as the times. You always think of them as the opposite operation. And so this is to say P or Q and P or R. And you can do the truth tables to verify that these two kinds of statements are equivalent. Right? And Figuring out equivalent statements, why would something like that be important? Because sometimes the statement that you care about, that you want to prove, is kind of difficult to deal with. And so you can deal with that by proving something that is logically equivalent to that statement. So I want to prove this, but I don't know what to do here. So let me find something that's completely equivalent to that and prove that. And this I can deal with easier, but if this is true, that has to be true and vice versa. So that's why logical uh, statements are the same. And at the end of the day, you have to be careful when you're reading certain statements, what are those equivalent to? A lot of times, and pretty much all the time in human communication, these, it's not logical at all. Like human communication is 
emotion based, right? But to do math, you have to be logically based. Okay, so you have to be very careful when you're interpreting certain things. Right? And as I said, yeah, P, Q, R, these are just, they are statements that you can determine to be true or false. Yeah? Is there a circumstance where the converse is, converse is true, uh, converse is equivalent to the regular? No, the converse will never be equivalent. But you can have the two individual statements be equivalent, and in that case, you write this. Right? So if the converse is happens to be true, and I say happens to be true because you, you can in no way guarantee ahead of time that that will be the case, um, you write this symbol and you say there, and you say the statements are equivalent. You would never say the converse is equivalent. No, right? I didn't know the exact number of the original statement. Yeah, so well, we spoke about that before you came in, I think. So yes. um, you can watch the video and see where we, where we mentioned that. Okay, what else is important for us to know? Quantified statements, super important. And I, I think this is the last section of what we're going to do logic. So we'll finish logic today. Um, we'll, we'll jump hard into proofs next week, so next week we'll start chapter 3. Um, so the next, last section here is quantified statements. So this section is all about when you're reading mathematical language, how to interpret it. And as I said, it's something you have to be diligent about, especially if this is the first time seeing proofs, you make mistakes at first, but you have to really like buckle down and force yourself to be OCD and read exactly what is written. A math book will always write exactly what is meant, not what it expects you to think it means. Can I go over my friends? Fine. Do you mean to find <laughs> Right, that's never gonna happen in a math book. Okay. So uh, quantified statements. Um, sometimes we encounter statements that may change truth values depending on conditions. And so, to avoid confusion, such statements So you place a condition. So it's kind of like, remember when we were, the first example where we said, well our third example where we said x is even, right? That wasn't even a statement. Why? Because there, I can't determine whether this is true or false, right? Because I don't know what x is, what context we're looking at, and then you might say, okay, assume x is a part of a member of this set. And then we can say, okay, yeah, now I can determine whether it's true or false. But sometimes just telling you where the, the variable lives isn't enough. You still have to quantify just how comprehensive the statement you're making is. Right? So you might say an example, if I say if x is a real number, right? So I know the context. I know that okay, the next thing I'm reading is referring to real numbers. Then x squared minus 1 is greater than 0. Now, if you look at that statement, you're in a weird position because it turns out that you can kind of determine truth values, but it will actually switch on you, right? So you might put in some real values, and it's true. You can determine it for sure. It's true. But then other values you plug in, it's now false. So you kind of have this statement that swaps on you, right? And that is not a good statement because you don't want to have to not know still. So it, it's kind of a tricky kind of statement where the truth value can be determined, but it can change still within the context that you're considering. So what you can do is you can quantify. This needs 
to be quantified since it's determinable, but its true value can change. And so we would say something like, we care about two quantifiers. Right? There, there are many, but we'll mostly care about two. Sometimes you literally write it down just like this. 
Um, usually where we identify something like by calling it a name is if we're doing a proof by induction and we will call oh, it. Okay. <clears throat> I have a question. So sometimes I see like the quantify the statement, it's like some form of redundancy where it's like Say they put for all x and r, and then they say such that x is greater than zero. When they and now it's forming a black paper they just say like for all x and r plus or something. Is there is there some reason for that redundancy? Is that just for clarity, or is that for like no? I mean, they could say something like for all x in r, and then they'll put x more like this. Yeah. Yeah, they can list a bunch of conditions. That's fine. Yeah, but like. So like that would be equivalent to like for all x and r plus. Yeah. So it like, means that this this is a list of conditions that you must apply mm -hmm. for everyone that fits this list of conditions. Yeah. Right. Because sometimes you can't just use a single condition. There might be several conditions you want to impose. Yeah, so wait, uh, I um, and this, huh? No. Sometimes you might want to impose several conditions. Okay. Right. So you writing this and then putting a statement here. Is it would be the same as for all x in r plus. That would be another way of writing. One is more concise than the other. Um, but it turns out sometimes it's because maybe the thing they want to say, there's no notation for it. So they have to use several things. Right? What, what is it like that? Like there is a notation for or something? Like is, is there like some like class where that's important? Like just that, or is, it, is that just too no. much clarity? No. Oh, okay. Why? Because these are logically equivalent. It's just another way of saying something. Okay. And some people can just they take forever to say one little thing. Some people can be more concise. So there's nothing with being less concise or versus. So that's that's not really a concern. Just make sure that you understand the notation. Whether when once something starts with an upside down a, it means something. It means after reading that, every single thing that fulfills the conditions this statement will apply to. And after reading this, the statement that follows only applies to some things in the set. Um, there's another one that you might use sometimes, very rarely, this with a that. Now what this means is, factorial, not factorial, because it's not a number. So there is a unique. So for example, I can, and it's, it's not common, it's not very common. But someone might use for emphasis. Right? So especially the fact that they're about to say is surprising. Do you know there's only one person for which this is true? They might use that, right? When it's like, oh my god, you know, they really want to emphasize something. But uh, usually they won't say it. So I can say, you know what, there is exactly one x in n such that x is less than 2. You know? So you can make that statement. Although it's, it's correct to say that this is true. Right? Both of these would be correct. Right? So people usually just go with this. Unless they really want to like, yeah, there's only one, guys. <laughs> right? That this is true. Right, so you can emphasize uniqueness with the factor, and that that kind of that, and this again, it's a it's actually a common thing. So you learn like common conventions. So you know that a strike through usually means not. So if someone says equal, striking through it means not equal, or they can say something is a member of the set. Striking through it means it's not a member of the set. It's also true that. Sometimes they can throw an exclamation on a quantifier and it will always be interpreted as it's unique. Right? So they can say um, x is equal to 2 and that's the only possible value they can do. They can just throw in an exclamation point at any given time. So don't be afraid of it. Don't think they're shouting at you. <laughs> x is equal to. They're not shouting. Throwing in an exclamation point attached to some sort of logical symbol is just a way of identifying uniqueness.
everything I wanted to say about logic. Right? So I mean, not a lot of class participation here because that's, I was just mostly throwing definitions at you. But next class is going to be a lot more interactive, I think, because okay. we'll actually start proofs. Let's, are there any yeah. other questions? Okay, so uh, in the homework, I think there was a question where you had to partition you know, the natural numbers. Mm -hmm. So I was assuming which context, is it with the zero or without the zero? Because I, I just didn't with the zero because that would have been easier. Why? I don't know, like, that, that just reminded me of that. Because oh, I believe your textbook does not use the zero. It does not? Yeah. What if I like make a comment and say, assume the zero is included in there? I, that, <laughs> that would be fine, I guess. Okay. Um, um, but um, try try to work within the context of what you're you're okay. you're given usually. So I believe in your book in the first part, um, like something like the natural numbers, because it can go both ways. Any source that uses the natural numbers, they'll tell you like in the beginning, like in an index or something, what they mean when they say. Mm. Okay. Right. And you should work in that in that context. Because sometimes because it's not just like there where it might be easier. Sometimes it would be actually wrong. Right? So the statement that they make about the natural numbers might be wrong at zero. So it's not a trivial thing to say. Yeah, but that one to do Because if, if I include zero. Yeah, because if, if in this case this statement is false if I include zero in the natural numbers, but it's true if I don't. Right? So it's, it's important that you, in N is interpreted within the context of the literature that you're reading, right? And I believe in our textbook, one is, zero is not included. So whenever you're reading the textbook, our textbook, it's, it starts at one, right? And if they want to include zero, they'll do something like N union to set zero. They'll do, right? Which can sometimes make the notation a little bit more cumbersome, but it just depends. How would you write, like, because um, going back to the problem, like, the way I partition, I just, like, listed one and then three away and then three away and then two and then three away to partition the whole natural numbers into three different sets. How would you write oh, every well, third maybe number? Maybe tell me the question. What was the question? Uh, the question was to partition the natural numbers. Before you partition into three sets? It's to a set of cardinality of three, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the partition itself has to have three, three subsets of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's actually harkening back to something we'll call the integers modulo n. You can actually split it up very nicely by the remainder mm -hmm. um, when divided by three. So you'll have three groups where you'll split it up into things that look like 3n, three 3n three plus 1, 3n plus 2. And I can. Uh, yeah, and like, how would I? Those repeat? are all the possibilities, right? And you let n greater than uh, to zero. Every natural number will fall in one of these groups. If your n is um, zero, it will. If your n is one, it falls in this category. If n is, so it's all multiples of three. All numbers that when you divide by three, the remainder is one. All numbers when you divide by three, the remainder is two. That will literally partition all of the natural numbers. And it turns out that there's something called a division algorithm, which you can prove that literally for any multiple that you care about, you will have that many <coughs> partitions. So I can talk about divisibility by five. Every integer has to be one of these guys when you're dividing by five. All integers will fall in one of these five groups. So that's that's we'll we'll talk more about that when we talk about divisibility and integers. Can you just select a number and say if x is less than say three and then x is greater than three and x is also yeah. three? Yeah. As long as when you take the union of all the sets, you get everything, but the sets themselves have no intersection, you're correct. Um, but this particular way I did it is nice because it will connect to, you'll see the color of that. We'll see, we'll, when we do divisibility, it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, can you negate quantifiers so not for all is consistent as there exists? Oh, yes. Which, there's some that we should talk about. That's actually important. And that's kind of, <clears throat> that's actually important. I thought I was forgetting something. We're going way too early. I think I was forgetting something. 
Okay. Um, negating quantifiers is also an important thing to do. Negating quantifiers. Um, so let's say um, P of X is a statement depending on X. And so I say for all X, comma, this statement is true. Right? How would I negate such a statement? Or if I say there exists some X such that P of X is true. How would I negate such a statement? Can we just choose the quantifier? Is that for all you need to like there exists? Yeah, but tell me what the statement would look like. For all x, this is true. What is the opposite of saying there exists an x where this is true? Not true. Not where this is not true. So it means that there exists an x such that not p of x. Right? So if I'm saying there work, this works for everybody. You can say, no, there is someone, there's at least one person for which that does not work. Okay? Um, so we can say, uh, you know, every prime number is odd. No, there exists a prime number that's not odd. Right? And it turns out that, that such a prime number is unique, so I can just put it in an exclamation point if I want to know. There's only one prime number that's not odd. Right. So, yeah, it, talks, it turns out that negating a for all it becomes an exists, and you have to negate the statement that applies to it. So you, you actually have to remember to negate the statement following it as well. So the negation passes through the quantifier, it switches it, and negates the statement. Um, if you, yeah, so if I say, there is at least one person such that P of X is true, what's the opposite of saying that? For all, For all things, it's not true. There exists a negative prime number. No, all prime numbers are not negative. Right? And so when you're actually reading this, it's nice to look at it in sentence form, for example. Sentence form, I think, is going to be important. So you can talk about statements and their negation. So you can say something like, all um, S R P, you know, all odd numbers are prime or something like that. You can say some S is not P, right? Or someone can say some S is some S R P. You can say here all S are not. You can say all S are not P means that some S is P. Right, so this is talking about when you're targeting <coughs> group groups things, which is often going to be something under consideration. And by the way, I'm sort of implying here that if I negate a not, I get back the original. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if, if you want to convince yourself, you don't just like, oh, that makes sense, I feel like that's right. You can actually prove that from a truth table. <laughs> so if you have P, not P, and you negate not P, and so if this is true or false, this is false or true, you negate this, you get that P. This is equivalent to P. So negating a negation just gives you back the original. Um, and so I can say some S R not P. And this will mean all S R P. So you can negate for all and you get a there exists or for some, and you can negate a there exists or for some and it will be for all, but you have to make sure that you negate the statement following as well. And something like that is important to a, like a proof by contrapositive, and we'll talk about that. So if you want to um, do a proof by contrapositive on statements like these, you might have to know things like that. It'll come up.
every now and then. So it's good to know about a statement, what happens if that statement does not happen, what statements are equivalent to say, because sometimes proving something directly is difficult, you want to prove something equivalent to it, um, and vice versa. And sometimes that would involve assuming that that thing does not happen, and then you have to know how to switch from not. Right? So if someone gives you an or, you can negate that, so you know if they say here P or Q, here you know, oh, either not P and not Q. Right, so if you're reading these in sentences and you want to know what is the opposite of this sentence, well, these guys tell you how to do it. So negating ors become and and vice versa, but you have to negate the statements. Negating for all becomes there exists, but you have to negate the statements. Negating there exists becomes for all, but you have to negate the statements. So thanks for reminding me. I totally forgot to mention that. So negating quantifies is also very important. Um, but we'll stop there, and um, on Tuesday, we'll actually start learning some proof techniques, how to prove things, and you'll see where the influence of logic comes in. I'll mention it here and there on Tuesday. Oh, this works because in the truth table it says this. But then after that, we're not just not going to worry about it. It's kind of like, okay, here's the limit definition of a derivative, and then after that, you're like, you're just thinking, this is for us. It's going to be like that. But everything we'll do is based in logic, based in... Um, foundation lies here. So it's important that you understand what happens here to get more comfortable. Um, be sure to leave your homework here and I'll see you guys on Tuesday.